Hey guys, <laughs> enough with Scott's uh, IMDb rap sheet there. Um, Saturday, welcome to Behind the Couch with LA Not So Confidential. Good to see you all. It's just the two of us today, no guests. We broke free from from the guests for a little bit. No, we have a, we do. We have a professional guest. We have. Uh, uh, we do. We have. Um, Mr. I think Nurse Robles. I think Adrian's going to jump on. Uh, Kelly, we'd love for you to jump on as well. Any other nurses that are milling around? Um, what's up? Oh, your hair looks amazing. I just got it done, and so I don't look disheveled. So <laughs> can try for to us. Aw. Why, why does his lighting look so good, and we look like... like? Because he's probably like 20 years cool. younger than us. That's true. That's I'm a true. vampire. Mm. Damn it. Tell us your secret later. <laughs> ha, well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we just have like a crazy news week. It's been like that for a while, but I feel like every time I was in doing training this week with new crisis negotiators, and every time I looked down at my phone, I was like, oh my God, what is happening in I the know. world right now? I know. People were sending me stuff, and um, I was following some of this nurse bot stuff on TikTok of all places, where is um, my other home where I'm currently making an ass out of myself. So please feel free to go follow Dr. Shiloh on TikTok. <laughs> I'm trying to get Scott on there. You guys know it will be 10 times more hilarious than anything I could ever think of. So um, let's start a petition for that and get it going. Once it's on the internet, it's on the internet forever. Remember oh, that. I know. Um, <laughs> let's see, let's do some Patreon stuff at the top. Yes. New, uh, new Patreons. Uh, thank you so much. They just keep coming in and it's wonderful. Lori E and Tammy M. Thank you thank so much. You, we ladies. really appreciate your support. Yes. You'll be getting some swag. Indeed. You will be getting some stuff that is going out with our new folks. Everyone in March, your stuff will be going out soon. Um, on that note, talking about sending stuff out, um, I'm going to spin the wheel. We are going to let this Patreon member who wins a giveaway pick any mug of their choice. So let's do that for March. Who we got? Oh. It is Tosh. Ooh. Tosh. All right. Tosh, we'll get in contact with you and make sure you get a mug. So, um, and then we have some really exciting news. Scott, do you want to give congrats to one of our Patreon members? Yeah, this is super cool. Uh, we want to give congrats to Patreon member Jen, who just finished up um, the academics for her graduate degree in forensic psych. And she's Ooh. graduating in May with a 4.0. So <gasps> clearly... Over Clearly, teamer. she has a robot brain, which is not <laughs> fair. But we're very proud of you. We're just like, and thank you for um, being a part of the big family. And and yeah. it's a great career. I'm very excited for you. Very yeah. excited for you. Thanks for letting us know. And we yes. um, we love to hear this stuff. And Jen, please let us know what you go on to do after this. So excited for there's so many folks graduating and new horizons in their life, and we're super excited for everyone. Because we've been there, done that. Kind of miss school sometimes, but not as much as I don't miss school. Um, <laughs> we do have our date for our Hollywood walking tour. So that's going to be Saturday, June 4th. We will start taking reservations soon. And Patreon members have first dibs. So they have already gotten this info and have been given a heads up. So please stay tuned to our social media for ticket purchases. Um, gonna have about the same size as last time if you are a patreon member we will pay your way everyone can be bring a plus one so um yeah it's gonna be super fun it'd be nice to get together with you guys in person again so. what we will do this time though that is just only slightly slightly different and we had and if we had known to do this and been more prepared we would have is um we will give you as we get closer to the date we'll give you more instructions about what the um, food break is in the middle. That was kind of not explained to everybody, including us as hosts. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was a little disjointed. And I think we're, I'm going to try and make it a little bit more organized so we can all, there's more of a chance for us to socialize together. Okay. Would yeah. They, if, yeah. if there even is a food break, I don't know if there will be, I don't know what Chris has put in our itinerary, but we'll figure oh, that all okay. out for you if it's going to be there. So okay, cool. Oh my gosh, if, if you guys flew to LA, that would be insane. We it's, Scott and I should be coming to you guys, like going to, let's do walking tours all over the country, so. Yeah, I'm so ready to go. I'm Believe me, I'm ready Would to you? travel. I Would like, yeah. I'm ready to, to get moving. Yeah. So um, why don't we get to the nurse Redonda Vought story first? Yes. Um, since we have Adrian on and just in case you have to jump off for anything, we don't want to take up too much of your time and we'll see how long this conversation goes with some of our other, um, healthcare professionals on here. So I yeah. don't know if people know what I'm even talking about. So, uh, just a quick rundown for you guys. Um, recently in Nashville, Tennessee, after a three day trial, Redonda Vaught, a former nurse, was criminally prosecuted for a fatal drug error that occurred in 2017, and her convictions were for gross negligence of an impaired adult and negligent homicide. So, like I said, I've been following this, has clearly been gripping nurses across the country. Um, so she's 38 years old. She was arrested in 2019 and charged with the reckless homicide um, and the gross negligence <clears throat> of a woman who died at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in back in 2017, as I said. And the neglect charges stem from allegations that Vought did not properly monitor this woman after she was injected with what turned out to be the incorrect drug. So uh, the, the patient, Charlene Murphy, she was 75. She had been admitted to Vanderbilt for brain injury. And at the time of the error, her condition was actually improving and she was being prepared for discharge from the hospital. And according to some of the testimony that happened during the court trial, um, Murphy, she had been prescribed a sedative to calm her before being scanned in like a big MRI like machine, I believe. Um, so Vought was then tasked to go retrieve the medication uh, from, I guess, what is like a computerized medication cabinet. Does that sound right, Adrian? Um, oh, fixes. Okay. Okay. And anyway, grab the wrong um, medication. And according to some part of the investigation, this negligence piece, I guess the, the medication she was supposed to get is a liquid, but she ended up grabbing something that was a powder and then injected Murphy with it. Um, and by the time the error was discovered, then Murphy was brain dead already. Uh, so before we kind of dive into the controversy of this, with Adrian, I would just love to know your thoughts, like when this came on your radar, how closely you've been following it, what it meant to you and your profession. So um, I sit on a board of uh, the American Association for Men in Nursing. I'm, uh, I'm part of the board of directors uh, for membership. So when this happened, um, we communicate with other nursing organizations and we, you know, we, we talk about different things of what we can do in collaboration uh, you know, to promote the profession of nursing. Um, and so when we heard about this and when this was going on, we we're following it closely, like all other nurses were across the country, I'm sure, and across the world. And we were worried that as soon as they criminally um, convicted her of the two tar uh, of the two charges, we were, a lot of us were like, wow, this is, thanks for throwing us under the bus because just culture um, has been an ongoing theme in nursing, at least since 2010, when the American Nursing Association, um, they wrote a, a position paper talking about just culture. And, uh, and Adrian, can, make... you, can you define that a little bit? Because I mean, I, me working in government, we, I would love for, I mean, we have the same thing. So if you could just okay. explain for our listeners what just culture means. Right. I was, I was about, just about to explain it. So just okay. culture in the nursing realm is, you know, if you make a mistake, um, be the first one to to uh, say it, you know, mm -hmm. and so we can troubleshoot as soon as possible. 
and you're not going to be um, you're not going to be thrown under the bus. Uh, you're not going to be, get in trouble because you told us in a timely manner we can now help this patient because, uh, you know, medical errors, unfortunately, is uh, one of the leading causes of uh, death in, um, in, um, in health care. And, and when you're talking about, uh, especially with the pandemic, when you're already dealing with short staffing, you're talking about unsafe ratios. That's why California is so big. Well, we used to uh, until you know, pandemic happened and things, you know, got a little uh, crazy, but uh, like New York and, uh, and California have been huge on safe patient ratios because our nursing ratios, because, you know, if you have an ICU patient, you should only be monitoring one to two ICU patients per nurse, right? And if you're trying to throw more people and assign more patients to a nurse, that's already overwhelmed with the complicated uh, health of, of the patient itself. Um, yeah, it's going to cause errors. You're going to uh, cause uh, um, you know nurses to be more fatigued. Uh, they're going to miss things, right? They're just culture is, hey, if you know you made a mistake or you almost made a mistake, please let us know because how are we going to be able to troubleshoot this and so this never happens again, right? Right. And that's where you end up having where uh, we now, like here in California, I can only talk about um, where I work. We have um, scanners. We scan the the medication that's um, attached to the patient, right? Uh, in this case, for Redonda Vaught, she was about to, um, uh, you know, she was uh, the patient was prescribed uh, Versed. Versed is an anxiolytic, right, um, for anxiety, right, to calm her her nerves uh, before she uh, were to go into this machine. And um, instead of uh, because they weren't in. The nurse, they weren't in the unit that she was assigned. She was um, downstairs or wherever that, that machine was. And she went to that Pixis to pull out the medication. So it could be different and not really connected. Uh, so when she was looking for the medication for said, it didn't pop up. She uh, put in an override code that a lot of nurses do, unfortunately, because of time, right? We're all about time management. And, um, she put in VER or VE or something, and then what popped up was uh, not only uh, Versed, but the Vecaronium. Mm -hmm. Vecaronium is very powerful. Um, uh, what, what do they call it? It's it's oh. a paralytic, isn't it? We lost oh, we your just sound, lost you. Adrian. Adrian, we just lost your sound. Yeah, we can't hear you. Nope, still can't hear you. <laughs> we can't hear you. Sometimes if you get a call or a text at something that comes in, it screws up the audio. Now can't we can't. You. We just lost. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, yes. you're back. I'm so sorry. Somehow my phone is connected to my tablet for whatever reason. Anyways, okay. Patient was prescribed uh, uh, Versed. Uh, instead, she pulled out Vecaronium, which is a, a paralytic. A uh, paralytic that paralyzes everything. And you would only have a paralytic for uh, which this one is like the most powerful, one of the most powerful medications we have. And um, if someone's on a, a ventilator and um, they're breathing over the vent, for example, we want to control their breathing. And so they're not breathing so much. So we will control their breathing if they're on a vent. So unfortunately, when this was given to her, she wasn't monitored because she didn't know that was the uh, that was the medication she just gave her. And uh, that's when you know, uh, everything shuts off, you know, and breathing, uh, everything. And she's uh, unable to say anything either because she's paralyzed. And then by the time she found out, she was already brain dead. So um, very sad because she also came forward on her own. So Redonda Vaught didn't wait. She didn't, you know, say, okay, I'm just gonna let this play out. She actually uh, self-reported and said, hey, listen, I, I gave this medication mm -hmm. on accident and she was distraught. So um, of course they, they fired her um which i'm not arguing that uh but then they um they reported her to the nursing board the nursing board cleared her because she self-reported because they are saying hey just right. culture she, she came forward we didn't find out later on it wasn't until a couple years later when um i think it was centers of uh, medicare or uh, for the insurances they came back and they're like no you have to do something so it's just anyways oh. so um this could happen very often. Um, nurses, most nurses, I would say, have had um, uh, 
Um, they have given the wrong medication, uh, maybe not as crazy powerful as this one, but they have given medication in error. And you know, they, uh, what's supposed to happen is you, um, you tell, you know, your, your coworkers, Hey, I need, you know, I'm going to need to help. Uh, this is what's going on. You monitor the patient to make sure that there's no adverse effects that occur. And then you stabilize the patient. If there's anything, um, that happens, uh, because of that medication that's been given. It scares us because now you're going to get a lot of people, a lot of nurses that are not, they're going to be reluctant to say anything now. Sure. You sure. have just made things a lot more dangerous um, by uh, not allowing there to be just culture and, and uh, reinforcing that idea that, hey, you're going to be protected because you came forward on your own. You didn't, uh, you didn't try to um, hide things. Right. So you either have to be perfect or yeah. when you do make a mistake, hmm, sorry, you might go to prison. And I think, Adrian, you hit on something really, really important that I'm, I'm not sure a lot of people realize is an issue even prior to COVID is the idea of how medicine in our country has become this conveyor belt, time managed, managed care type of practice. I mean, this was an emer this was, a, I mean, this wasn't like a, a, an appointment back to back. This was a different kind of uh, situation that, um, this nurse was in, but again, um, it's about like the pressure instead of giving employees the time to slow the process down so that they can be informed um, users of the machine. I remember Nurse Jackie did a great thing about the Pixis when hospitals started implementing them across the country. And now granted, some of that is done because with a good reason, because there was a lot of stuff that went missing Mm -hmm. as would happen in any hospital setting. But the more we manage care in order to squeeze every bit of profit out of it and don't give nursing staff and, and medical staff the support that they need, things like this are gonna happen. It's just inevitable, right? It is, and um, you know, and, and it could have happened to, to anyone and it has happened to people uh, where you know they're not they're not doing it out of malice um th this is actually shouldn't have been this shouldn't have been this should not have, got, have gone that far um i get it lose her license okay um i get it but why try to criminally convict her um after she's been cleared it just doesn't sound right um there was some uh stories that have been occurring and again i don't know the full story but i know that enough that um i guess vanderbilt was um was also trying to um, cover it up in some way mm. right after the fact and that's where a lot of people are like so you're gonna hold the nurse accountable but not yeah. everyone the else up yeah. the chain exactly so and this is a teaching hospital and uh you know it just doesn't yeah. make any sense for us that's bullshit. she's a scapegoat in a lot of different ways that we're probably not even privy to um yeah i think it, you know obviously for me this this, this feels like, you know, some of the very, um, not the high profile serious stuff, but the low level situations in which law enforcement officers are prosecuted for, again, things in their job where they were put in a position or had to make a decision and we're all human. And right. sometimes those decisions are not going to be the best, especially when you talk about, um, you know, under significant pressure, so, you know, trauma is occurring and things like that. Um, so I, I think this is pretty landmark, you know, for the, the medical field to see something like this happening and people have to be scared, not because of their, again, they're not out there doing the wrong thing and hiding it. And now it's been like busted wide open. Yeah, It's just this level of protection that is sort of you know, cloaked that area of like, yes, there's going to be human error and we have to live with that with modern medicine. Um, it's not going to be there anymore, perhaps. We're, we're a very litigious country. Um, it's part of our culture, unfortunately, has become more of our culture, probably more so than than many other countries in the world. Um, Vought now faces three to six years for in prison for neglect and one to two years for negligent homage almost negligent homicide, excuse me, mm. as a defendant with no prior convictions. Now, wow. my hope is that, I mean, I don't know the system where she is, the legal system, but my hope is that that she would also get time served and some discount, which is usually what happens. And certainly out here in California, as you, you know, you can um, stack up good behavior and a bunch of other things 
and have your time reduced. But um, it is going to be a, a she is going to serve some time no matter what. Um, I do think that's it's really telling. Um, after the verdict, she said healthcare just changed forever. You can no longer trust people to tell the truth because they will be incriminating themselves. And the American Nurses Associated issued a similar statement expressing the same concerns about her conviction, saying that it sets a quote unquote, a dangerous precedent of criminalizing the honest reporting of mistakes. Exactly what you were talking about, Adrian. Yeah. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey, guys. Wait. How are you? Good. Way in. Yeah. So um, I know a couple of you guys already know I haven't worked the floor in nursing for about three years. I moved into administration. Um, I have a stack of incident reports um, every month from nurses giving wrong medications where they're self-reporting. And my concern is now they're not going to be reporting those things. Um, luckily, we haven't had any incidents, you know, since I took over that have re have resulted in injury or death or anything like that. But yeah, it's a huge concern. Um, I actually did not post this on social media or anything like this, but I actually did walk out of my job about three weeks ago okay. because our corporate office was pushing unsafe uh, nurse to patient ratios and it became to the point where I was uncomfortable as an administrator. I didn't want to work there anymore. Wow. Um, 32, I mean, we did residential treatment um, for substance use disorder, but 32 um, patients per nurse is just an Whoa. insane, yeah, insane ratio. And that's yeah, I had my were. mic off. No, 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 that's in, that doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, they're, they said, well, they're asking for liability. They're asking for liability. Oh, absolutely. Well, if you staff with strong nurses, I that's not a guarantee that I'm going to have a strong nurse walk in here. I, yeah, no I'm kidding. Able to right This now. happens everywhere where there, that's why we and in the nursing community and Kelly can probably uh, attest to this is like, we talk to each other. Hey, what do you think about this place? Oh, no, I wouldn't go there because mm -hmm. they're unsafe. I don't want to lose my license. We all talk about it. And we just kind of step away from that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So as an administrator, Kelly, I mean, are you hearing buzz about like trying to preemptively get out in front of this potential future problem of nurses not reporting anymore? Or is it just like everyone's heads are spinning since this? I haven't heard out? anything. I haven't heard anything about that from the corporate office or any higher ups or anything yeah. like that. It's not been talked about in our building at all. Um, the nurses are talking about finding a different job, finding a different profession. Wow. Um, I've discussed before, and Adrian probably feels this too. How many people have you heard? Oh yeah, I went to nursing school, or and you, you've never known that person to be a nurse or anything like that. I had uh, 25 people start in my starting class. Seven mm -hmm. people graduated, and two of us still hold our nursing license. Oh my gosh! Wow. And I graduated in 2011. So get ready, guys. We're gonna have no cops and no nurses in the future. No cops, no nurses. <laughs> We're, but see, even before the pandemic, we were dealing with a lot of short staff, uh, like, you know, high census, and then we're short staff. We're always scrambling to get more people to come and work, right? Now you're going to create a situation. Not only did the stressor of the pandemic uh, force a lot of people to go elsewhere, maybe stay within nursing, but not stay at the bedside, yeah, right? right? Now they're teaching, they're doing other things, right? Uh, like but now you're forcing uh, more nurses to now reconsider should I even be at the bedside giving uh, medications, right? Yep. It's going to slow the whole system down because now uh, nurses are going to be very careful, very much more careful. And then you're going to start to see an uptick in like uh, liability insurance on nurses. So not mm. only uh, do physicians have it, but we're going to probably start getting it too. Yeah, but there's a big pay differential. It's harder for nurses to afford those levels of insurance fees. That's all. Yeah. And I know where I work. Um, that's worked into every doctor's contract. That's not something that they ever have to pay out of pocket um, at, at almost every place I've ever worked. So, wow. Wow. It, it's incredible. I mean, I we'll see what this does, but um, I don't know. What do you guys think uh, she's going to get as far as the sentence? Has there been any rumblings of what people are hypothesizing? I mean, um, there's been a lot of talk and uh, you know these petitions that are signed, I don't even know if they're going to do anything. They're just saying, "Hey, listen, okay, I get it. Your, you know, the convictions already been set, but uh, no jail time. You know, no, no prison time for her." Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just it's un, uh, 
it's it's not you don't you don't charge a nurse for this when she's self-reported you you talk about like the angels of death that you guys talked about oh earlier gosh, on yeah. right and like did they get the same if not a lesser charge uh or conviction because of what they did and they there was premeditation involved all that stuff some of them you had yeah. yeah right so i mean it's it's really angering us to the point where yeah i mean kelly's right a lot of my nursing friends are like so like what can we do we always make the joke of like i you know we can be strippers right so it's like always like, we can totally do something else right oh man it's just it's it's crazy right now yeah i bet well um we uh are compassionate towards this for you guys we know it's tough scott and i know what it's like to have your whole industry sort of rocked by one incident um or multiples, you know, there, there are multiples yeah. and others, but you know, when something like this comes down, um, I know the fear that that instills and the worry and the, you know, did I just work all this? <laughs> Am I going to go to a different industry because of, you know, all the work I just did in the school I completed and the money I spent? Um, that's tough. Yeah. And, um, you know, as soon as it happened, uh, James, my partner, he's an, uh, a, a, uh, OR nurse in the operating room at a, uh, one of the prestigious uh, air, uh, hospitals down here. He um, he called me right away. He's like, Are you, can you believe this? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to this. I don't know if it's, this is going to catch fire and like be the, con like now the bar has been set uh, for all other uh, medical errors. And will it be even worse for someone that did not self-report, right? Um, oh, now sure. it'll be at the level, right? So, so you're weighing that risk. Mm, do I rat on myself or, or not? Um, do you guys know if, like, were there any groups or entities or advocates sort of uh, pressing for her to be charged and for a heavy hand in this that is like wanting them to be held responsible more so than they already are? Or, you know, because usually there's two sides kind of pushing, but I hadn't really heard of anyone like, yeah, fryer at the stake sort of thing. Well, okay. So if you go to any uh, group chat, right, there isn't anything that I know of, of like a, an entity um, that is going out there saying, hey, she should fry for what she did, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of nurses do chime in on those comments and they're like, hey, you know, there are multiple warnings that, uh, that pop up when you're about to pull that drug, right? And, you know, uh, depending on what um, system that you're working off of, it will tell you like, hey, are you sure? Okay. And even on the bottle, it'll tell you paralytic, right? So, but no one can, no one knows until they've been put in that situation exactly what was going on, right? Exactly. Um, I cannot, I, of course, like I'm careful, uh, but I don't know what was going on with her that day. Uh, there totally. has been some really messed up things that have occurred that I've seen and from what I hear from people that work at that institution, it's like the common thing. It's a very mm. toxic work environment. But like in nursing school, they do teach us something. It's called the 10 rights of drug admi uh, administration. And Kelly probably knows this like, like all the other nurses know. Um, before you give a drug, we always have to double check, triple check. Is it the right drug, the right patient, um, the right dose, is it the right route, meaning like, is it, you know, intravenous? Is it uh, by mouth? Is uh, like, oh, are we doing this IV? Well, you know, uh, well, intravenous is IV, but I mean like uh, yeah. just different routes, right? Um, time and frequency. If anything of those are off, we have to notify the uh, the primary care provider who, uh, you know, who prescribed that as soon as possible. Because when you, wait, this doesn't make sense. That's why the nurse is there, right? To say, hey, doc, this doesn't make sense. Can you like clarify this for me? Because, yeah. um, this is a little too much for this patient or, Hey, we gave this other drug that's contraindicated with this, right? That's what we're supposed to It's a system. To do. It's a system that's supposed to work. It's yeah. A, it's a system. Right. And also it, we know going into this, that if we don't catch the error that our provider, the, the primary care provider prescribed this medication and we just mm -hmm. gave it without, um, checking, mm -hmm. uh, we already know that that's an instant, Hey, we're going to get our license revoked. Um, also right documentation, um, also the the right um assessment or we're going to assess the patient we're not going to give it um a medication that controls high blood pressure for uh, uh somebody that has low blood pressure right now i'm going to check the blood pressure make sure that it's high and i'm going to give the drug 
because it's going to provide that therapeutic uh, response, right? Yeah. So, um, but a lot of nurses, they bypass that because they know, oh my gosh, I have like four other patients I got to go take care of. I'm going to boom, 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 give this patient this medication. And then I'm going to roll over to the next patient. I'm going to do this. Oh, by the way, I have another admin coming in and I got to go deal with that. Oh, mm-hmm. I got a discharge going. So I have to do this all before this time or else I'm going to get yelled at kind of thing, right? So or it's this this global issue that on what this particular day led to this awful tragedy and like emily is saying yes this gives particular pause for me but this is also a big mistake um and i agree with her you know especially when i read like okay one's a liquid one's a powder i'm no nurse certainly but you know that that sounds like a clue sounds like a red flag to slow down no matter what's going on um, but yes, we don't know what's going on with her personally, how many long hours she had worked, how the, the, um, environment and system has created basically kind of setting her up to fail in this sense, even with the wonderful systems that are supposed to be there. Um, I think we've all probably worked in a place like this, maybe not the stakes so high where we're like, meh. I will say this though, with the powder versus the liquid, right? Because that powder, you crush it, you mix it with the bag, right? And then you mix that and it becomes a liquid and then you you uh, give it. Mm. Uh, but there's antibiotics that have that. There has been times where, oh, this is a new drug because you read it, you're like, it's a powder now? And then I gotta mix it? It's happened before where what you would imagine would be the norm now is in a different form. So. Again, um, it just adds to the whole confusion of like, maybe she was just on autopilot. She yeah. knew, okay, person has a brain bleed, stabilized, again, probably going to get discharged, no big deal. Yeah, again, exactly. Everything that you're saying always is circling back to slowing down the process and having more time for the individual, for the nurse to make sure that they're doing what they're doing. I'm immediately thinking of the times that I go in just for like a general checkup and blood being taken so you know you go in for your checkup once every your big checkup once every two to three years where they're taking three vials of blood where i go i go to cedars for a cedars medical group and i when the phlebotomist takes my blood there is no less than three times that they check my identity Hmm. is this your name can you, can you confirm it? You know, you're looking at the labels that they're going to peel off and put on the vials. Is this your name? Then the blood is taken and then it's put on the vials. Is this your name? But then the phlebotomist has time to do that. So right. once again, appropriate staffing, appropriate staffing, appropriate support, appropriate time for these procedures seems like it would address a lot of these, these incidents. You, you would, um, and I, again, like, um, and you're absolutely right. We should have more time, right? And um, unfortunately, we get bogged down with so much during the shift where we're having also to talk to other providers. We're having to talk to other places on in the hospital because this one patient has to get a consult for this, this, and that. I got to get this other patient to get this, this, and that. Um, you know, uh, and um, we don't, sometimes there are days where you don't have enough time to do anything. Oh, and by the way, people called off. So the uh, certified nursing assistants and the, the licensed vocational nurses that are there to help me um, take care of my patients uh, that are uh, turning the patients every two hours that are um, that are helping them bathe and helping them eat and helping them um, just with everything. Right. That they're not there now. Now I have to take care of it because I ultimately am in charge of my patient, mind, body, soul. So if I'm having to do that, I'm having to figure out how much time do I have? with each patient. And so um, they're, they're going to be taken care of and they're going to get the best care possible. And it's limited when you stack more patients on with one nurse. Oh, but they're a strong nurse, like Kelly said, right? Yeah. But what if they're tired? What is it? What if this is the fourth or fifth 12 hour shift that they've had? Oh, and by the way, they've got a family at home. Um, You know, uh, it's just, it adds so much complexity to it. And you're right. We should be able to slow down but that's where patient ratios is so important. So when you go to a state that doesn't have patient ratios, um, it it really should give you pause. Like, uh, what am I getting myself into? 
Great questions to pose. Well, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate it. I think this was important to cover just because it seems, you know, we love our nurses. And, our, <laughs> so and we your, ex your expertise, it. the expertise yes. and, and this perspective is so valuable so that it doesn't just get, you know, pulled into a five things you need to know about LaDonda, you know, oh, geez. right? you know, yeah. the, on the heavy page, you know, so this is this giving us some perspective is very helpful. Adrian, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you both for having me on here. Appreciate yeah, it. of course. All right. We'll see you soon. Bye. Um, so let's talk about Bruce Willis. Um, yeah. That's another big one that I think was shocking for, for many people really shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, gosh, I love Bruce Willis as much as we have, torn apart some of his movies the color of podcast. night yeah <laughs> uh, so bruce willis his family announced that he's going to retire from acting because he has probably been diagnosed for a while but he's been diagnosed with aphasia um which we'll get into in a second as far as what that is but essentially at the core it's a cognitive disorder that affects the ability to communicate um so it's interesting because, and, and Scott, add to this if you know anything else from the inside, but people who have worked with Bruce on recent films have talked about some obvious signs of some sort of decline that they have noticed. Um, there's been filmmakers who have described really how they have had to cut um, dialogue back where there can't be any monologues in his scenes because of his communication um, deficits and issues even though he's continuing to act um, there is talk that there's even an actor that would travel with bruce willis that um that would read him his lines um through a device in his ear and in there's also one alleged incident that is interesting because it sort of ties back harkens back to our issue we did about alec baldwin and and the issue that happened on the rust set where two years ago in cincinnati on the set of the movie hard kill that willis unexpectedly fired a gun it was loaded with a blank um, but he fired a gun on the wrong cue and two people you know, said that this was something that happened. Um, nobody was injured, but everybody was really, really shaken up by this. So there's been other, not just like verbal issues and communication deficits, but other signs of sort of cognitive decline in recent years. Anything else that you've heard, Scott? Well, it's interesting that a lot, you know, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, but there have been a lot of people coming forward with some very interesting information like you were giving there are people coming forward that have worked with them and they're anonymously telling journalists that we saw it you know five years ago six years ago seven years ago and um like just being able to do less and less but i will say this that it was the scuttle for many years that he you you were told if you were going to hire him it's like every all of his scenes are going to be done within a handful of days which is not uncommon for huge stars. It's really not True. uncommon, like depending on how long that you're going to be in. But the difference here is that if you look over the last decade, he you, he is, uses less and less screen time in each movie. But what is fascinating is how they covered it up and how it became this known secret. And everybody was like, oh, wow, he's really not doing so well. That to me is really concerning because we just did this whole we did a whole episode on britney and how in many ways right. like that's the question i have is who was making this decision because was he is he of sound mind to be able to say i know i'm limited i still want to be working like this sure but anyway i mean it's yeah i think it's true. pretty complicated Ugh. and i'll come back to that in a second but you know we do want to talk about it because there's a lot of like um really poor definitions of aphasia that are being um, out and about. And one of the things that's really annoying for me, and I got on a huge argument yesterday with somebody online, which is so smart because it's, it makes so much sense to argue with people. I know online. how you love to do so that. So here, here's Dr. Scott, you know, I love to do that. Um, but if you like, oh, wow, he's got aphasia. I want to find out what that is. 
So the first definition that comes up when you do that, it uh, tells you that aphasia is a cognitive issue and it affects expressed language and it also affects your ability to perceive communication, but it doesn't cause intellectual decline. But you have to read the rest of the Wikipedia page or you have to read the rest of the article to understand, yes, eventually it does cause intellectual decline. And it, uh, one of the most frightening things that can happen is you can be locked in. So at the beginning, you could have severe expressive problems, severe comprehension problems, and you are you know what you're trying to say, but you yep. can't understand what people are saying to you and you can't communicate to them. But on top of that, yes, there is intellectual decline, which was something a few people were arguing about. Well, like he knows what he's doing. He's making his decision anyway. Well, and so, that, that's easy to derive when you understand what aphasia stems from, which I know you're probably going to review like what it yeah. follows because that those things are linked with the cognitive decline. Yeah. So just a, a, a word to the wise for anybody that's doing research or looking up something you're interested in you know, look at the, you know, that first Google search paragraph that is from the most recently or the most highly cited article is going to give you two or three sentences. That's great. That's not the whole story. There are no. always, when it comes to mental illness or medical diagnoses, there's always going to be more information that you want to take in. But that being said, just sort of the hard, um, quick definition is aphasia is a language disorder and it is 99.9% .9 of the time caused by damage in a specific area of the brain that controls language expression and comprehension. And aphasia leaves a person unable to communicate effectively with others. So many people can have aphasia as a result of a stroke and that could, or um, head damage, um, some kind of brain tumor or a circulatory tumor or, um, what else dementia and um infection like aphasia in the geriatric population with no history of um cognitive problems can be caused by utis one of the things yes. they for like whenever yes. anybody in a nursing home starts to act odd the first thing they do is check for a uti because it is it's real you know with an older population it's really hard to keep them hydrated so your kidneys are working blah blah, blah. all that stuff is interesting but there are many types of aphasia. They're usually diagnosed based on which area of the brain um, area is being affected. It's usually the language dominant side of a brain is affected. And then they want to see what the extent of the damage is. Um, there's one uh, particular kind called uh, Broca aphasia, and they have damaged the front portion of the language dominant side of the brain. And individuals who have this Broca aphasia um, it's also called an expressive aphasia, for example, may eliminate words uh, like and and the from their language and speak in short but meaningful sentences, but just without those particular connective words. Mm -hmm. uh, they usually can understand some of the speech of others, but because the damage is in the front part of the brain, it's also important for motor movements, people with Broca's aphasia often have right-sided weakness or paralysis of the arm and leg. So that's Broca. And then there's another type of aphasia called Wernicke aphasia. Yeah. And Wernicke aphasia individuals have damage to the side portion of the language dominant portion of the brain, uh, sometimes called receptive aphasia. They may speak in long, confusing sentences, um, adding unnecessary words or creating new words in an attempt to um, make up for the deficit for the word that they can't actually retrieve from their brain. And right. they usually have difficulty understanding the speech of others. And this gets real diff difficult when you're doing a mental health evaluation, because you might, if you're not looking for aphasia, you might think, oh, it's word salad. It's probably part of, you know, hardcore schizophrenia. Could so be. once again, like we were talking sort of the theme today, make sure you look for all of uh, all of the possible things that are there. Yeah, I mean, this would be a huge, this can only really be diagnosed after a big neurology, neuropsych evaluation and assessment. Um, interestingly, this week in training, someone was doing a segment on 
negotiating with some of our military veterans and was talking about traumatic brain injuries and showed a video clip. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, Scott. I've never seen it, but it was a newscaster from a few years back. And she oh, was, yeah. they were throwing Which... live to her at the Grammys. And she, you know, has the mic and she's young and just starts talking and it is just gobbledygook and total word salad. Um, and I think it, she was interviewed afterwards and she said, I knew exactly what I was saying. The words were just coming out jumbled. Like I was as shocked as anyone else. And it's so sad. Like it's just yeah. to watch, you know, it's live television. And, um, but it's just such a significant clip to look at what that could look like, which is a sort of quote unquote normal person out of the blue. Yeah. Um, and who knows what, I mean, I think probably some information is coming out. Did she have a mini, mini stroke? Mini stroke. Something? Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. But, um, which gosh. is another reminder for everybody, you know, even when you're young and flexible and strong and jumping around with all your energy, go to the doctor, get a checkup, have everything yes. checked out. Yes. It's very important. Yes. Um, one final um, form of aphasia is called global, and that mm -hmm. was uh, usually as a result of damage to, you know, again, the language dominant sides of the brain and people with global aphasia have difficulty speaking or comprehending language. So it was like it's both Wernicke and Broca together. Um, you know, there are a lot of issues around this particular incident with or incident or this development with Mr. Willis. Um, that really shift the perspective on him. Um, for years, he has had an increasingly difficult reputation on set as being, oh, as you being know, difficult? hard to get along with, ir um, irritable. But now, you know, given the unbelievable stress he must have been under once he realized what was happening, it makes sense that he would also experience an increase in mm. um, the stress that's presented as irritability. You know, there are a number of people coming forward with stories of frustration and concern from various sets. They give examples of him um, not being able to hit cue marks, not being able to actually even pick up what was clearly being fed to him through the earwig, which is the the really hidden um, ear um, earpiece. Yeah, earpiece. Yeah. And then what's very interesting is that, you know, he it was a star. He was a bit of a brat on moonlighting because for those <laughs> who don't remember moonlighting made him a star like he it was supposed to be a co-star role uh with his female co-star really being the star of the show mm -hmm. and he was just a breakout success you know handsome charming sexy he could sing he played an instrument um it was very double my carries like the, the the guy that every guy wanted to be right you know always with a smart retort very funny uh, and then when Die Hard happened, he became a megastar. Like that yeah. was it. He was on the road to becoming, you know, who he is today. And imme almost immediately, there was a lot of things that happened, like with his entourage getting bigger and more and more demands. But, you know, that's just part of the game. Like when you're a star, you get those things. That's it. You married um, Demi Moore and, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but he also worked with a lot of directors who... Um, younger directors that were like, uh, yeah, I'm done with, I don't need to work with Bruce Willis again. And Aww. one of them was Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith's very famous, mm -hmm. um, very, very talented director and writer. And he directed him in Cop Out. And um, he said long before any of the Cop Out stuff, I was a Bruce, big Bruce Willis fan. So this is really heartbreaking to read. He loved to act and sing and the loss of that has to be devastating for him. I feel like an asshole for my petty complaints from 2010. Aww. So sorry to Bruce Willis and his family. So talk about just culture. I thought that was the appropriate thing. Cause yeah, no kidding. You know, but then again, it's like, who knows how long this has been going on, but it's a little, there was a little bit of a personality there that was a challenging personality. Okay. So it's um, complex. Chuck, in the chat, Chuck says that Vernickies can be set off by alcohol abuse and low vitamin B1. Yeah, we're, I think that's called Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. Mm. And that's what we used to see that at prison with some of the inmates that would come in that had been what we call wet brained for an extensive period of time. Like they were such oh. heavy drinkers that the alcohol was like really going past the blood brain barrier 
and doing damage to the brain. So yeah, yeah Wernicke, Broca, and then Wernicke, Korsakoff. Thank you for yes. reminding us of that. Those phrases probably have not come out of my mouth in like 10 years. <laughs> I'm just flashing back to like neuropsych. Yeah. That was the major neuropsych stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, one more thing I want to touch on before we maybe cover one more thing is that Abby was asking, is this the same thing that Robin Williams had? Um, no. So Robin Williams had Louis body dementia. Um, and as different. horrible as it is to say, Louis yeah. body dementia is actually even even worse. I mean, I'm knocking on wood. It's because they're all terrible conditions. But the Louis body dementia also includes uh, auditory and visual hallucinations oh, um, and right. horrific mood symptoms and derealization and depersonalization. And then the 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 locked in syndrome. It's it's a brutal, brutal it's a brutal, brutal reminder of how much we don't know about how the brain works. We know so much. And then mm. we come up against these, these situations that where we have no treatment for it, which is really sad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in our last few minutes here, let's just talk about uh, Leslie Van Houten being denied parole once again. Yeah. Uh, so she was one of the Manson women convicted in 1978 at her third trial because a couple of the trials went um were appealed or were deadlocked juries and she ended up being convicted of two counts of murder one count of conspiracy and was sentenced to get this span seven years to life quite a span <laughs> um so she is now 72 years old um basically came up for parole again and California governor Gavin Newsom last Tuesday blocked parole for her after a panel had recommended that she be free after spending half a century in prison. Um, interesting, right? Cause we have a, a governor that is pretty darn liberal. Um, but I completely get it. There's nobody, it doesn't matter if you have, nobody's going to touch that or they're never going to get elected again. God. That would be, that would be co political career suicide for him to, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I approve of it. I right. don't, you know, I don't know how I feel about it. All what I do know is that there's just wildly different uh, prison sentences for things. I mean, with John Hinckley, I mean, I compare right, this to John right. Hinckley. John Hinckley yeah. is going to be released. Oh, you know, I thought he, he, never was, he was already released. He was on um, modified right? released. And oh, now okay. he'll be on full release. Uh, I think mm -hmm. he was in a halfway house with monitoring. And then the next thing will be from NPR. John Hinckley will be monitored for the next nine months. And if he doesn't ah. get into any tr more trouble, he'll win full unconditional release from court oversight in June 2022. So oh, remember... Okay. Okay. Hinkley was found not reason, not, not reason, not guilty by reason of insanity in 1982. Mm -hmm. He never went to prison. He went right. to a psychiatric facility. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I know he didn't go to prison, but you look at that versus like that attempt versus what Van Houten has done. I, I there's, there's just so much to pull apart. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it, Conversely, like we we're going to talk about this other case where this person was granted parole, um, someone this week who there's actually a podcast out about it, but it's about the Chowchilla um, school bus kidnapping, where this man kidnapped a school bus of children for ransom in the 70s as well, I believe. And he was just granted parole. Um, but I, I know we've been asked to sort of do profiles of the Manson women. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to kind of tease this apart and look at culpability and what is really, what is, is it governors fearing they're not going to be reelected? Like, is someone really going to put up a platform of like, he met, he let the 72 year old Manson woman go quote unquote. Um, because you can always say the parole board recommended it and they know her best. But I, guess I, I don't think it makes any document. difference because because he knows i mean i think newsom i mean this is just you know our we rarely go this far into discussing politics but mm -hmm. um i think newsom is someone who sees down the road uh oh sure possible this presidential isn't the last stop. 
Yeah. No, this is not the last stop for him. And so he is doing what he feels he needs to do to protect that legacy. But then, and it's also like, you look at this, I mean, I, they buried a bus full of children, which just is horrific. I mean, the, the trauma that those poor kids I experienced. Can't. Right. And yet you have to be reminded of it. Like you have to go, oh, right. That thing happened that in 1976 and oh there were kids involved and, and nobody died that does not that is not as sexy and dangerous as anything having to do with the manson family right you don't have to remind anyone of what that incident was yeah that's exactly for sure. so he Despite said the fact that our system would work better if we really did look at whether or not they were going to be a legitimate threat yeah because he does community. say that she quote currently poses an unreasonable danger to society if released from prison at this time now that would be interesting to see how he quantifies that because i'm not really sure how you would do that well right because um if a panel gave a recommendation i'm sure they had a psychologist do a violence risk assessment um, oh absolutely where's he pulling that from you know um yeah I don't know. Uh, Abby said that there's a fantastic documentary on the Manson women on Netflix. So uh, maybe we can figure out a way to talk about that. But yeah, we should. Oy. Oh, it's a sh it's a show. OK, um, everything's a, a series now. So, I mean, it was or... like I, I it was a cult. He was a charismatic leader. They right. were doing acid nonstop. They were teenagers. <laughs> there was I mean, it's. I'm not making excuses. It was a horrible, horrible murder. I'm just saying that there is a, you know, we do have to hold the opera, the, the chance that some people given the right opportunity can change. Well, those, those or, factors or are else. clearly not present now. Right. Exactly. I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, I actually had a client that uh, was in the same prison with Leslie Van Houten um, and they did a, they, they would, they put together a women's lifers group, like support group together. Um, and they were quite good friends. And uh, the woman that I saw had gone to prison uh, essentially for killing her husband. It was a battered women's syndrome uh, issue. And uh, of course, talked very highly of her. And the client I saw wasn't supposed to get out of prison. She could have been there for life, but she eventually got paroled. Interesting stuff. You might hear an episode on battered women's syndrome in the near future, guys. Yeah, um, we gotta, we've got to do that. It's on our list. I wanted to show everyone our... Whoop, Did me... the stickers come in? The stickers came in. Oh, hang on. Let me turn my light off. Just kind of tilt it down. Yeah, there you go. Look at those for CrimeCon. Aren't those adorable? I have coffee. Scott has a microphone. How appropriate. Awesome. Wait, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, I think that's good for today. Thanks so much for hanging out with us, everyone. Yeah, we have CrimeCon coming up. If you guys are still thinking about it, please make the drive if you can. Make the trip if you can. We would absolutely love to see everyone there. We want to... Uh, the whole reason we're going is for the people that are going to be there. Um, our friends, our listeners, and we can't wait. That's absolutely the best part. So... Yeah. And for those of you who are of a certain age, the uh, recommendations came out for anyone over the age of 50. Oh, yeah. Do please consider getting another booster. Yep. I'm going probably tonight or tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah. I thought um, you were going to go. Especially I was going to go last night, but mm, I got busy. Mm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> be safe. Everyone take care of yourselves. Let's knock COVID out of the park so that we can all start traveling for even more events with each other. Let's um, that do that. Awesome. Uh, Shannon, I love that you said I demand an LA not so confidential versus Dr. Phil rap battle. Um, I have recorded a TikTok about Dr. Phil that may not get me invited back to CrimeCon. So <laughs> I'll run it by my partner first. <laughs> That's okay. We would rather, we'd rather go to the other ones where, where we're with our kin. We like that. He does have a doctorate, but his psychology license is no more. Emily's asking if he was even a real doctor. So, 
he I, he was a psychologist until well a conversation for another time another time yeah all right bye guys we'll see you later take care bye